If there's one thing that absolutely fascinates me the most about this game in all of its lore, I've got to say it's the mystery of Conria. Just the idea that there's a nation that breaks the norms of everything we know about Tevat, and it's treated in game like it's just one of the nations on Tevat. It, so much so that Kaya is just from there, it's just fascinating. But we know that it's not just one of those nations, it's something else, and we know that it is building up to something. The first event of version 1.2 was the Chalk Prince and the Dragon, an event that held an entire story quest within it. This quest follows Albedo as he studies the Traveler, looking for something that might set him apart from the rest of Tevat's humans. But it wasn't just as simple, and it set a lot of foreshadowing for a future story. And that foreshadowing was just the tip of the iceberg. Most people are going to be able to pick out the mysterious and obvious holes missing in the story, but for those that are curious enough, the questions that the quest leaves open leads to quite the rabbit hole. I've been diving down this rabbit hole quite a bit as of late, and I wanted to consolidate some of the information and connections into one place, and then use that as a framework for some speculation. So let's start with the most obvious part, the trailhead of this mystery, our sweet, handsome, blonde boy, Albedo. Why is everybody from Conria so hot? Part 1, The Story Albedo's past is a foggy one. He has no recollection of any true blood tied family. His earliest coherent memories are of him doing the things he is most familiar with in life, studying the world around him with his teacher, Rina Dotier. Rina Dotier is the only family Albedo ever had. She was the one that raised him, and above all, she was the one that taught him alchemy and the discipline that comes with it. His life with Rina Dotier was quite monotonous. With her, his existence was quite simple. He was told to explore domains, to learn about alchemy, and to uncover the secrets of the world of Tevat. The same old, same old, day after day. That is, until they came across an artifact, the Heart of Nibirius. What the artifact is, Albedo, and by extension we, don't even really know. He didn't get the chance to know, because the night Rina Dotier came across the artifact, she left her student not but three things. A classical text, a recommendation letter, and a note, which read, Albedo, go to Mondstadt and find my oldest friend, Alice, and give her the recommendation letter. Complete your final assignment. Your final assignment? Show me the truth and meaning of this world. The classical text that Rina Dotier left with him was one of the last surviving copies of something called the Opus Magnum. With the gift, she also gave him the title, Kreidenprinz, and the acknowledgement that she had nothing left to teach him. The assignment gave Albedo anxiety, not just because of the daunting size of the task, but because of what might happen if he didn't complete it. He felt that if he did not complete the assignment, he would not get to see his teacher again. But that couldn't distract him, he had more pressing matters. He promptly arrived in Mondstadt, recommendation letter in hand, and was promptly thrust into Mondstadt's Knights of Favonius. The work he was met with was quite easy to his surprise. He initially thought he could do his mindless work with the knights, and then use the rest of his energy on his mission. However, he had another problem on his hand. A child arsonist named Klee, who also happens to be the daughter of Alice. So now, with Alice gone, Albedo researches the world around Mondstadt with Sucrose, Timaeus, and sometimes Mona. That's the story, paraphrase obviously, given to us through Albedo's in-game's character story. What strikes me as most interesting about his story is how much is left vague. In most other character stories, the view we get of the character's past is more or less omniscient. Not so much in the case of Albedo. There is so much that is left unknown, and I'd hazard to say that there is more missing than usual. Some details here and there are left out, yes, such as the name of Mona's teacher, where Alice eated off to, and probably the most obvious example, Fischl's real name, but those are seemingly left out for a particular reason, usually based around the character themselves. With that logic, yes, you can say that all that is missing from Albedo's story are things that he does not know, but I feel like he knows so much more, and there's something that Mihoyo is keeping from us. The biggest mystery presented through Albedo's story is Rina Dotier, his mentor. Rina Dotier isn't the first secondary character kept vague. We don't really know the name of Mona's master, but what's weird about Rina Dotier is that there have been plenty of chances to expose what she's about and why she was doing the things she was doing, but Mihoyo decided to keep those details from us. From what we can tell, Rina Dotier completes the triumvirate of extremely powerful women in this game, Alice, Mona's master, and Rina Dotier. They're all friends, or at least they know each other, and their descendants, Klee, Mona, and Albedo, also know each other and are seemingly tied together by fate, creating their own extremely powerful, weird little triumvirate. We also know that Rina Dotier disappeared after finding an extremely powerful artifact, the Heart of Nibirius, and then leaving Albedo to his own devices. Interestingly enough, Nibirius is a name connected to, to real-world mythology, as a surprising amount of things are in this game. 
This time around, Nibirius is the name of a demon depicted as a three-headed dog or raven you choose. He is a very noble and high-ranking demon and teaches the arts of cunning, especially through rhetoric. He is depicted extremely noble and confident in stature, so basically the embodiment of demon nobility. What this heart does, we don't really know, and we don't even know what role Nibirius plays in Genshin or how he's depicted. He could be accurate to the real world idea of Nibirius, but he could also be just something that happens to share the namesake, kind of like Paimon. We don't really know. All we know is that the heart is an extremely powerful artifact, so much so that it caused Rina Dotir to just straight up leave her kin, and to leave him to find the answer of the universe. So we know that Rina Dotir and Albedo have something close to a mother-son relationship, but we don't quite know to what extent that relationship holds. In Albedo's story, it says that Albedo considers his master his only kin, which could be interpreted as the only person that treated him like family, yes, but we could also interpret it in another way, a more biological way. Part 2. Alchemy So it's a pretty popular theory that Albedo isn't human, and is in fact something closer to a homunculus, and I buy into that to an extent. I think we can glean what he is much deeper than what other people have said, though. One strange thing with this game is that a lot of characters have names that roughly equate to real-world characters and ideas, such as Barbados, Paimon, and Nibirius. Albedo continues this trend, although instead of equating to a real-world character, he's the first that equates to something more abstract, and fittingly, it's an idea of alchemy. The book that Rena Doterre left Albedo, the Ma Opus Magnum, is a very obvious reference to the Magnum Opus, or literally, the great work in real-world alchemy. The Magnum Opus describes the process an alchemist must take to turn a material, or the prime materia, into the Philosopher's Stone. The Magnum Opus is made up of four-ish parts. Nigredo, Albedo, Citrinitas, and Rubedo. The immediate connection is quite obvious, but the connection gets a lot deeper than only a connection through namesake. One interesting detail comes with the book that Rina Doter gave Albedo. One of the things that the story says is that when Rina Doter gave Albedo the book, she also in practice gave him the title Kreidenprinz, which translates from German to the Chalk Prince. Throughout both Albedo's character story and throughout the event quest, a very strong parallel is drawn between Albedo and Chalk. This title of the Chalk Prince solidifies the connection to something more than just a obtuse parallel. So what does this have to do with real world alchemy? Well, let's run through the first two steps of the magnum opus to see. Step one is Nigredo, which also is also called blackness, which roughly means putrefaction or decomposition. The thought was that, in the first step to the Philosopher's Stone, all the ingredients had to be basically cooked into a uniform black sludge. Contrary to how modern society sees death, this was seen as a spiritual cleansing as well as the cleansing of all the ingredients. This sets up a pattern where everything that's done to ingredients also has to be done to the soul. Cooking everything and decomposing it rids it of all its impurities and where the pureness can be separated from the black sludge. If it sounds like I don't know what I'm talking about, it's because I don't. There's not really a whole lot of details on the steps of the opus mag of magnum opus, whatever. Uh, and everything is kind of conflicting and or the steps blend together. It's a little strange. Step two is the big step, albedo. The term vaguely translates to whiteness from Latin. The step follows the chaos of Nigredo, where the alchemist purifies the black sludge. It's like a washing away of the impurities, leaving only a white, perfect substance to be turned into the Philosopher's Stone. Spiritually, Albedo represents the split of the alchemist's soul into two opposing principles. These two sides are to later be united during the final step, Rubido. So how does this apply to the character Albedo? Well, one motif that pops out everywhere with their character is the idea that from soil is born chalk, and chalk is this pure, perfect substance. This chalk can then birth perfect beings, such as Albedo and the Traveler. He even says that him and the Traveler are the same in that they are born of chalk, and they are perfect in that way. So is Albedo the embodiment of the second step of the magnum opus? Uh, well, yeah, he is. Because of this, I think that Albedo is not the main subject of the magnum opus. He is not the one to create the metaphorical Philosopher's Stone in this case, whatever that may represent for a uh, Chemia alchemist. In this case, I think that Albedo is a result of another alchemist stepping through the magnum opus, Rina Dotir. Remember when I said the first step represents death and decay, and the second step represents splitting the spirit, separating the pure from the impair? Well, I think that this is what soil birthing chalk means. Soil is, scientifically, the result of death and decay. 
A dead plant or animal dies and falls to the floor. In response, the composers will eat what's there to eat and leave waste behind, which is what soil is, roughly. So soil is itself the embodiment of Negredo. In the world of Chemia, the logic goes that if you purify soil, you are left with white chalk, a perfect substance. My logic is that Rita Dotir took the first step into the magnum opus, doing things that we have not seen and we do not know, and somehow that first step, soil, transitioned into the second step, chalk, where she split her soul in twain, one saying into herself and the other birthing chalk, aka Albedo, a perfect alchemist. Does this mean that Albedo is literally half of Reno Dotier's soul? Well, I don't think so, but I think that it holds meaning at least metaphorically. I think that Albedo is a created creature, a humunculus or not, and I think that this is why he was created. He was created to fulfill the second step of the magnum opus. So what's the third step? Citrinitas is one of the more com complicated and conflicted steps, because Citrinitas can sometimes be considered a part of Rubido, but sometimes it's considered its own step. I'm going to consider it its own step, although I don't think much changes if you consider it a part of Rubido. Citrinitas roughly translates to yellowing. The step refers to the transmutation of silver into gold. There's really not much into it. It basically represents the transition of the pure substance created in Albedo into something that can create the Philosopher's Stone. Here is where we pay attention to one of the weirdest bits of lore that we've gotten when Dan Slave was announced. Yes, I'm still talking about this guy. And that is this poem thing by, and I kid you not, a self-proclaimed prophet. And he says, The original calamity had been overturned, yet the island in the sky set the earth to burn. Chalk pursues gold in this time inopportune, the eclipse is swallowed by the crimson moon. It goes on past that, but the main line of interest here is chalk pursues gold. This line, I think, carries multiple meanings, because chalk and gold each carry their own meanings. If our connection between Tevat's idea of alchemy and the real world idea of alchemy holds true, then chalk can represent both Albedo, the second step of the magnum opus, or Albedo, the alchemist. So why can't gold represent the same thing? For those that don't know, gold is canonically the alchemist responsible for the cataclysm that took place 500 years before the events of the game. He was an alchemist that studied chemia, and he got too powerful and caused the cataclysm somehow. So this could be referencing gold in that way, but it could also be referencing gold in another way, a more alchemical way. What if gold in this situation could be referencing the Tevat equivalent of Citrinitas? So this then means that this sentence can be interpreted one of four ways. Chalk, the alchemical step, pursues gold, citrinitas. Chalk, the alchemical step, pursues gold, the person. Chalk, the person, pursues gold, citrinitas. Or chalk, the person, pursues gold, the person. While the second one I don't think really makes sense, the other three do. The first one is describing the step of the magnum opus. To become a powerful alchemist, you must turn chalk to gold. The third line refers to the fact that, as an alchemist trying to find the meaning of this world, Albedo must turn chalk to gold. Whether this is in more of a literal sense or more of a spiritual sense where he himself must become gold is unclear. And the fourth line means that Albedo is pursuing the alchemist gold, whether in person or in opus. I don't think gold is alive anymore, but gold was the greatest alchemist maybe to ever live. So it wouldn't surprise me if Albedo wants to pursue the work that gold achieved and maybe carry on what he was trying to achieve. So we have three steps to chemia that have their equivalence to real world alchemy. Soil Negrito, Chalk and Albedo, and Gold and Citrinitas. So there's one last step, Rubido, which doesn't have its parallel. Rubido means reddening, and again, unlike the optics of red in modern culture, medieval alchemy saw red not as gory or a warning to stop, but instead as the color of gold in the Philosopher's Stone. Rubido is more of the climax of an alchemist's career, their ultimate goal. It's similar to a kind of ascension, and most importantly, it's the reuniting of the two sides of the alchemist that had to be split in Albedo. I think that if the parallels hold true, that whatever Tevat's version of Rubido is, is going to require the alchemist to unite once again with their two souls that split during Albedo. So I think that this means that Rina Dotir is going to unite once again with Albedo as a part of completing their journey. Overall, all of this theorizing makes me suspect one of many things. I think Albedo's story about learning the reality of this world isn't actually his story. I think it's Reno Dotier's. I think we're experiencing only half of the story. It's like we're playing a Mario game, except we only see the game from Luigi's perspective, or Toad's perspective. Albedo isn't the protagonist here. He's a side character. Reno Dotier is the protagonist. But, but again, that's all speculation. 
Albedo's quest, The Chalk Prince and the Dragon, revolves around two things, most notably the Traveler, but the second point of interest is the dragon mentioned in the title of the event, Durin. Durin was a dragon who died around 500 years ago during the time of the Cataclysm. Before the Cataclysm, both the Valen and Durin were perfectly happy dragons, until that dong or gold turned them on us. That cataclysm that gold caused corrupted Durin and made him evil. Dvalin, in turn, had to fight Durin in order to protect Mondstadt. Dvalin won, but not without a cost. He was poisoned by Durin's corruption, and that's what we see at the very beginning of the game. The defeat of Durin fell in Dragonspine, and that's the massive corpse we can see in Dragonspine, is probably what causes Dragonspine to be all weird and eternally cold, although to what extent that weirdness is Durin and what extent is whatever the fuck else is going on on the mountain is unknown. That's all well and good, but I have a question for y'all. Where the fuck did y'all get the assumption that Durin was created by Rita Dotir? Honestly, I see that assertion literally everywhere, but I can't, for the life of me, find anything from any of the cutscenes in any event that supports this assertion. And people say everywhere, on Reddit, in on the wiki, even in my fucking comment section that, oh, Durin is basically confirmed to be the cre creation of Rina Dotir. Is it circular reporting? Did I just miss like a major line of dialogue? I don't know. So here's my question. How was a dragon that was probably hundreds of years old already by the time of the cataclysm created by an alchemist that is alive or at least was alive recently enough to know Alice and to create Albedo? Are we assuming that she's immortal? Are we assuming she knew gold? If she's that much older than gold, then that means she must be thousands of times more powerful and knowledgeable than gold. It may make sense on the surface to call Rena Dotir the mother of Durin. Maybe the evidence just, that's, that's the immediate assumption you can make. The evidence kind of makes sense, I think, until you take into account the timeline. If Rena Dotir created Durin, then we're assuming that Rena Dotir was a mature, well-experienced alchemist, able to create higher-functioning life. So, she must have been middle-aged at the least at a time before the Cataclysm. Let's just assume for the sake of argument and ease that she was 40. Now, for the sake of generosity, let's assume that she created Durin in the state that we see him in, fully grown and capable right off the start. That means that Rena Dotir, assuming she's the mother of Durin, is at least 540 years old, unless she's some god that got out of the Archon Wars unscathed and unseen, I don't believe this. So here's my question for the day for y'all. I want you guys to prove me wrong. Show me what I missed when researching the connection between Rena Dotir and Durin, whatever evidence people are pulling out of their asses that says that, oh, it's basically confirmed, and also give me rationale for her being the mother of Durin. I don't believe for a second that she's at least 540 years old. There is rationale that says that she could be even older because I, because Durin probably wasn't like months old by the time he fought Dvalin. He was probably already hundreds of years old. So give me that rationale. I want to know why people are saying that it's basically confirmed. Aside from that little ditty, the quest gives us some rather interesting points. This quest goes to show that Albedo is probably going to be very central to the later game in some form or another. He has strong ties to Conria and he practices Chemia. He is tied to a lot of things that seem to have importance but are out of the scope of what we know, such as the flower that blooms in the event quest that is literally from another world. He is most likely a created creature by Rena Dotir, who also seems to be a very key person in the story. Although this quest shows us plentiful ties between Albedo and the later game, we actually have one huge bit of dialogue that gives us a very solidified glimpse of what importance to the story Albedo might play. The problem with Chemia is that it has the power to destroy, and destroy it once did. The talk of gold and the cataclysm he caused is not completely irrelevant to the story of now. We seemingly have somebody who has a similar power to gold, a similar size of knowledge, and he knows this. Albedo knows what he's capable of, and he wants to make sure that if he does lose control of Chemia and cause the second cataclysm, that the Traveler is there to stop him. I think that line of Chalk Pursues Gold has a deeper meaning then. Chalk pursues the power of gold, and that means that Chalk might cause the same thing as gold. I may have jumped the gun of making fun of that self-proclaimed prophet. He might actually be pretty damn good at what he does. So y'all are probably aware that we're on a dry spell for story right now. Um, the next story we get is 1.3. Um... So yeah, it's going to be a while until we get something. I, depending on when I release this video, I'm recording this on January 19th. I might 
be releasing this video later into the month, maybe even into February. Don't know how long it's going to take to actually edit. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'm going to be done with making Genshin stuff until we get new story. Um, I've covered everything that I want to cover. I don't have anything that else I can bring to the table that either hasn't been talked to to death or just hasn't been done straight up better than anybody else. So I'm done with Genshin stuff until we get new story beats in 1.3 or 1.4 or beyond. Um, so yeah. There are other videos that I want to make, other video essays, um, some gameplay videos. I have a video that I want to edit that's just me and a friend fucking around on a random Minecraft SMP server that we found. Um, <laughs> so I want to make that. And then, um, yeah, and there are a few other video essays. But even though I'm not going to be doing Genshin again for a while, I still just want to say thank you guys for the support on the Genshin videos, it's honestly insane um, how much you guys, one, enjoy the videos, but two, how much, like, how much the discussion you guys add. I love how respectful and, like, amazingly, like, I, I just love how respectful my comment section is. It's very chill it's just discussion it's you guys discussing a game that you guys love and it it doesn't get toxic at all it's just really fun um it's fun reading your guys's comments and some of you guys bring up some really really good points um and really good pr perspectives and i hope that we can keep that up um and keep growing this community nurture it to something better um it's teeny 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 tiny and that's the only reason why i can keep it so wholesome and so respectful is because it's really small but hopefully we can keep that kind of um that kind of community I, I really appreciate having people that are that are really respectful and respect each other's opinions so um long story short thank you guys for the support and uh i'll see you guys whenever there's more story to cover so later y'all